question before the conductors allow le electricity to flow freely. What's really moving is electrons. Conductors allow electrons to move freely. That's what defines a conductor. Um, one consequence of that uh, it has to do with how charge is distributed over a conductor. Uh, so let's say we have a sphere, it's a solid sphere of some conducting material, say copper. We have a copper sphere. We give it a charge. We give it a net charge we, by either taking away electrons or, or uh, adding electrons. And then my question is, where does the charge go? Uh, take a second to think about it, see if you can figure it out. Uh, pause the video and think through where the charge would go. Um, so let's assume for a second that the charge would be, was uniformly distributed you know, throughout the thing. Oh, that might be a natural assumption to make. Now what would happen? This charge on the outside here, like it's got forces on it from all these other charges. They're repulsive forces, so it's going to push it toward the outside. Likewise, this charge, you know, it's got one charge over here pushing it inward, but there are a lot more charges in here pushing it toward the outward. So on each of these charges, there is a net force pointing outward. So the net force is outward, which means the charges wind up on the surface. So in a conductor, charge will always uniformly distribute over the surface. Uh, and I'm going to put uniformly in quotes. Um, if it's a uniform object like a sphere, it will be distributed uniformly. Uh, if it's an odd shape, it works a little bit differently. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> but the charge always winds up going to the surface because it repels itself. And so it winds up at the surface, and then there's, uh, you know, then there's no place left for it to go because it's stuck on the surface. It can't just hop out into the air. I mean, now, <clears throat> then when this charge all goes to the surface in the middle here, there are no charges. If we consider a point anywhere in the middle, there winds up being, you know, there's an electric field from this guy, there's an electric field from this guy, electric field from this guy, electric field from this guy, and all those fields are adding up. Uh, and while this point is closer to these, they'll have a stronger E field. There are more charges here that give a component in this direction. Uh, and so they wind up canceling out completely. And inside a conductor, the electric field is zero. There is no electric field inside uh, a conductor, right? Uh, which can seem kind of weird, uh, but but that is the case. This is the principle behind uh, what's called a Faraday cage. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Faraday cage, uh, but they put it around sensitive equipment. It's basically just a like a conducting shell of some kind, like you might make the room out of copper or something, uh, so that there is no, uh, so even if there's like a, a strong charge outside the surface here, there is still is no E field inside the conductor because any charge on the surface stays on the surface. Um, and so, you know, these Faraday cages, which are just conducting shells, are used to, to shield sensitive equipment so that they aren't impacted by electromagnetic things going on, like external electromagnetic things like the cosmic background radiation or uh, or random sunspot activity or whatever. Uh, yeah. Now, when we have a conductor, all the charges at the surface, and because these charges distribute themselves, they distribute themselves so that there is only a net outward force on them that then isn't enough to yank them away from the atom. Uh, so that they they arrange themselves, and we'll draw positive charges this time, it doesn't really matter. They arrange themselves so that there is no uh, horizontal component of the force on them. 
And because of that arrangement, that means that at any given point, the components of the electric field parallel to the surface all cancel out. Because if there was a component of the electric field parallel to the surface, then this charge would tend to move, and then you know it wouldn't be just the charge wouldn't be distributed the way it is. It would move and you know settle out wherever equilibrium occurs. So there is no horizontal component to the E field. So one of the rules of our field lines is that uh, field lines will always uh, field lines are always normal to conductors. They hit conductors at right angles. So whatever else might be happening, the field for a positively charged conductor will point away from it and it will be perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. Right? Um, yeah. So, and a particular consequence of this is that if you have a pointy area of a conductor, say we have a conductor and it's like shaped like this, you know, it does whatever else over here. Um, the charges over here wind up being more densely packed. I didn't draw that big enough. Uh, okay, something like that. The charges over here wind up being densely packed because what cancels out is the uh, parallel component. And right at this tip, the parallel components are, are very small because it's only getting a parallel component from these charges that are further away. The charges right next to it, uh, or the, sorry, these charges further away are pushing it mostly perpendicular to the surface at this point. So only the charges right at that tip will give a parallel component uh, that needs to be canceled out. And so then there isn't as much of an electric field. And so the uh, uh, charges tend to cluster at points, pointy parts. Uh, because in those pointy areas, there is a, you know, having more charges there will create less uh, of a parallel force. Um, and this is the, the principle behind a lightning rod. Uh, so it's a common myth, I guess, that a lightning rod attracts lightning. Um, what a lightning rod really does is, so what lightning is, is that there's enough of a charge difference between, you know, your cloud and the ground. There's enough of a charge difference that the lightning will arc and move charge even across air, which is an insulator, right? because there's this huge charge difference. What a lightning rod does is because it, it makes the charges so densely packed right at the tip there that they're densely packed enough that they can actually push each other out into the air. And so this the charge kind of bleeds, I put that in quotes, bleeds into the atmosphere. Uh, which prevents there from being enough of a charge difference for lightning to happen at all. So if a lightning rod is working correctly, uh, there won't be enough char of a charge difference to to produce lightning uh, in the first place. Okay. Um, and I also want to make the point, I mentioned this Faraday cage, and there's a, this phenomenon of there being zero field I mentioned a Faraday cage. The phenomenon of there being zero field inside a conductor uh, is known as shielding. Um, so, like charges outside of a conductor don't affect the electric field inside the conductor. But that shielding only works one way. If you have a charge inside of a conductor, uh, it doesn't shield the outside from the effects of that charge. So say you've got your conducting conductor, say it's a shell, this is a hollow sphere, and there's this charge in the middle, right? This charge still has an impact on the area outside the conductor because this charge causes the inside surface of the conductor to have a negative charge because it attracts the negatives. And because the electrons then move inward, and they're attracted to this positive charge, the sur exterior surface has a positive charge. So if this has a charge Q, this inner surface then gets a charge minus Q, 
and then the outer surface of the conductor gets a charge plus q. And so there's still this net effect of, you know, for areas outside the conductor, it's just as if the conducting shell isn't there and this charge does whatever E field it does. Then inside the conductor, things are, are there's still zero charge inside the conductor because the minus and positive. The, uh, the field from this positive charge is canceled out by the field from the negative charge. And so inside the conductor, there's still uh, zero, zero charge. All right. Um, one other important concept is the concept of a ground. Um, and the ground is just a place where electrons are free, free to flow to and from. And it's called the ground because, like, you just kind of bury the wire in the earth, and then you've got your conductor or whatever. Uh, you, you just bury this wire in the earth, and the ground is symbolized with a triple line, I think. Um, and the Earth has a bunch of electrons floating around. And so, you know, if you're attached to the ground, you can electrons can flow freely in and flow freely back out, depending on what's going on in the sphere. Um, so let's say we have this sphere, and it's initially neutral. And we bring a positively charged object close to the sphere. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, pause, take a second to think about it. Um, so these positive charges are going to attract electrons. And so electrons will, kind of, will flow in from the ground, giving the sphere a net negative charge. So, you know, the positive charges are there, uh, but there are more negative charges. So move, bringing this positively charged object close gives a net negative charge to the sphere. Um, this is another means of charging an object. We talked about rubbing objects together, taking electrons that way. Um, this is a method of charging known as induction. You bring this positively charged object close, the electrons come in, and then you cut the ground so it no longer electrons are no longer free to flow. Then you just move the object away, and now the sphere has acquired a net negative charge, uh, even though nothing ever touched it. Uh, that's a method of charging objects known as uh, induction.